If you're looking for an easy weekend project, this is it. An easy nativity. There are no interior cuts and even the exterior cuts are easy. Uh, it should be a project that even a beginner on the scroll saw can handle, but yet it still gives you a nice little decoration for your house. Let's get started. I'm always looking for new patterns and this one showed up on Steve Good's site just the other day. He actually releases at least one pattern a day, sometimes two or three. Yeah, I think he might miss a day once in a while, but not very often. This he's calling a layered nativity, no interior cuts. And uh, he also said it's a layered beginner level nativity pattern. And it's beginner level because there's no interior cuts and even the exterior cuts are pretty simple. And uh, so I thought uh, it's simple, but yet kind of, it's good looking. It's, uh, it tells the story, simply. So I'm going to make one. In fact, I'm going to make two. These are all out on quarter inch poplar that I had left from another project for some reason or another. And so the pieces are all laid out and they're ready to cut because there's no interior cuts, there's no pilot holes. So all I had to do was lay them out on the poplar and now they're ready to cut on the scroll saw. I've used and tested a number of different brands and styles of blades over the years, and the Pegas Modified Geometry Series are my first choice for every project now. The size I choose depends on the thickness of the wood, the hardness of the wood, and the complexity of the pattern. Since the wood is only one quarter inch thick, poplar is fairly soft and the patterns are all simple, picking the number three blade was an easy decision. The star was the first item I happened to grab off the stack, and it happened to be a good starting place. This star has only four points, so it will be easy to cut. I started at the edge of the board and aligned the blade so it's aimed right at one of the points. As I reached that point, I followed the line along until I reached the first intersection. The angle there is a large obtuse angle, so it was easy to make by rotating the workpiece until the blade was facing the next line and then cutting along it. I kept following that line off the end of the board so that instead of having to make an incredibly tight turn, I could start from the edge of the board to follow that line. The next intersection was another easy obtuse angle. <laughs> and you thought you'd never hear that term again after high school geometry class. When I arrived at the third point, the one at the top of the star, it was nowhere near an edge, so I couldn't just keep cutting to the edge and start over there. But this wasn't a difficult turn to make. I came to the end of the line and when I reached the point, I rotated the workpiece and started cutting in the next direction. If the point comes out rounded rather than sharp, you can always go back later and touch it up with a file or sandpaper. The top piece for Mary came next. Remember, this is the layered nativity, so the detail is going to come from the depth added by the layers. I started cutting at the top of Mary's head, then followed the line down to the bottom of the figure and continued cutting off the edge. This allowed me to remove the waist piece and to start the cut across the bottom from the edge. This illustrates the easy way to make an edge cut involving an angle. I cut across the bottom and when I came to the far edge, I made the more or less 90 degree cut in another manner. I slowed the video down considerably here so you could hopefully get a better view of what was happening. As I came to the corner, I stopped the forward motion of the workpiece so the blade was no longer cutting. With the blade still running, I pivoted the workpiece until it was facing in the direction I wanted to cut next, and then I started cutting again. Cutting the rest of the head piece of the project was a matter of carefully following the line. This piece will later have another layer added on top of it, so you want to cut carefully to ensure they match each other perfectly. The next piece is the baby Jesus in the manger. I started cutting at the lower left and cut up the side. At the top, I eased off a little bit on the blade, turned the wood into the next direction I wanted to cut, then started pushing the wood into the blade again. Cutting the rest of this piece was a matter of following the curves around to the bottom. There I had the choice of making a 90 degree turn or cutting past the intersection to the edge of the board and then making the last cut straight across the bottom. I chose the second option. I picked the donkey for the next piece to cut. It gives me the opportunity to give a cutting tip. Whenever you can, you should start at a point rather than in the middle of a curve. In my experience, I have found that frequently, when I cut a piece that is all curves, I end up with a small rough spot where the cut started and ended. My reasoning is that the blade ends up in a slightly different relation to the cut line than where I started, and that creates a tiny bump. 
It's easy enough to sand smooth, but I'd rather keep that spot from being created in the first place. I started and ended the cut on the donkey at the tip of its ear. I'll start cutting up in here, and as you can see, as I go around the pattern, I'll be finishing at a point, avoiding the creation of a rough spot. I followed the lines around to the bottom and took the easy way out of cutting to the edge, removing the waste piece, then rotating the workpiece 90 degrees to make the straight cut across the bottom. If you're new to scroll sawing, the next part of this pattern may be a little challenging. There are some tiny movements needed to cut the details on Mary's face. If your scroll saw has a speed adjustment, you may want to slow it down to cut this area. At slower speeds, the blade is less aggressive and easier to control. I peel off the pattern and place the other piece from area in front of this one so you can start to get an idea of what the layers do to add detail to the project. The next part adds yet another layer of detail with Mary's arm and hand. Holding the three parts together gives a good preview of what they will look like when glued together. I think those are all the pieces from Mary, so now I'm ready to move on to Joseph. I started cutting with this straight line for the base and made the 90 degree turn, then cut up toward the head. There is some small detail here just as there was with Mary, so you want to be careful in those spots. After cutting these details, the rest of the figure is easy. Just take your time and follow the line carefully. Just like Mary, Joseph has a second layer which is his robe, and on top of that is a third layer to give him an arm and a hand. I cut the second and third layers here, but there wasn't anything different to show or new tips to share. Once again, I held the three layers together so you can get a better idea of what the completed project is going to look like. The next part is small and it goes on the front of the manger. There are some curved cuts close together, and when you put this piece on top of the manger, you can see that the detail it adds makes it look like there's hay spilling over the sides of the manger. The pattern calls for quarter inch stock for the back and bottom in addition to the figures. I used poplar for the figures, but I can't resaw boards the width I need for these two parts. I was temporarily out of half inch thick poplar, or I would have planed some down to that one quarter inch thick, but I didn't want to wait until I got back to my hardwood dealer for more half inch poplar, so I decided to use quarter inch Baltic birch plywood as I had quite a bit of that in stock. I cut the backer board first and started with a cut all the way across the bottom. It probably would have been better planning to make this cross cut on the table saw or even my radial arm saw, but we always plan better in retrospect. Steve Good showed the backer with a straight top on his website, but afterward he thought it would look better with a curved top. The plans show a straight top with curved dotted lines, so you can choose either version. I chose the curved top, so I made those cuts next. Another good choice I did not make was to rip this piece to width on the table saw, so I continued from the curved top down the right side of the back. The table saw is much better than a scroll saw at making long straight cuts. You may have noticed the pattern coming loose as I was cutting. I attached it to the plywood using spray adhesive, probably my least favorite method of adhering patterns. If you use too little, as I obviously did here, then you run the risk of the pattern coming loose. If you use too much spray, then removing the pattern can become a major task. This back will attach to the bottom with several tabs, which are what I cut next. I made the horizontal cut in from the edge first, then the vertical cut up from the bottom. When the two met, the waste piece popped out. Then I made the vertical cuts in the middle tabs. Since these were inside, I had to make a 90 degree turn from a vertical cut to the horizontal line to complete the cut. I want these to be as accurate as possible for nice, tight joints with the bottom. Cutting the base will be much like cutting the back. I made the cut across the bottom first. Once again, accuracy in cutting the tabs is of paramount importance in order for there to be a tight fit between the slots and tabs. I made the first vertical cut in from the edge, then I made the parallel cut on the other side of the slot. When I reached the intersection, I carefully backed the blade up slightly so I wasn't cutting, then I swiveled the workpiece 90 degrees. With the blade now lined up with the next line I needed to cut, I fed the wood into the blade once again. I followed the same procedure for the next cutout. It was time for one of those little moments of truth, checking the fit between the back and the base. The two pieces fit together with enough friction that I knew once I had a glue, this would be a strong joint. The fit wasn't perfect because there were small gaps. 
They were there because the scroll saw isn't very good for cutting straight lines, but the gaps are not likely to be noticeable after the figures are added. The glue up of the back and bottom needs to be done first because I'm going to paint this assembly before I add the figures to it. Since I'm using a slot and tab construction for this assembly, I'll be adding glue to the surfaces that will be touching on both the base and the back. It's handy to have a small glue bottle for small assemblies like these. This bottle originally held Elmer's glue, and once that was gone, I kept refilling the container from a gallon bottle of white glue. I used two long F-clamps to hold the assembly together while the glue was drying. Once the clamps were in place, I used the square to ensure that the back and bottom were at 90 degrees to each other. This is important to make sure this sits flat and also so the figures fit against the back and bottom properly. The nativity scenes details in the depth of the figures rather than from complex cuts. I used the photo of the scene from the plants to show me how to put them together. I started with the manger. There was only one extra piece to add, one that looked like there was hay spilling over the sides of the manger. I squeezed the bead of glue onto the back, then used my fingertip to spread it around. I put some glue on top of the manger as well, onto the area that would come in contact with the piece being added on top. I added two spring clamps to ensure the two pieces mated well. There were three pieces that made up the figure of Mary. I squeezed out a bead of glue on the back piece and the one that would go on top of it. The third piece was much smaller as it consisted only of Mary's arm and hand. After ensuring the pieces were aligned properly, I set this assembly aside and put together the Joseph figure in the same manner. Then I came back and added clamps to the Mary and Joseph figures. When the glue is first applied, it's quite slippery until it starts to set up, so setting parts aside for a couple minutes before adding clamps can help counteract this. One reason I like to use spring clamps when I can is that they apply pressure straight downward and there's less tendency for the parts to move than with F-clamps. When you use F-clamps, turning a screw to tighten the clamp sometimes causes the pieces to move out of alignment. I painted the back bottom piece a dark blue and with the paint dry I can now start gluing the pieces to the base. I squeezed some glue onto the back and bottom of Joseph so that he would be attached to both the bottom and the back. I did the same for Mary. The star obviously only needs glue on the back. I was hoping the spring clamps would open up far enough to use to attach these pieces to the back, and they did. I let these pieces dry before I came back to add the manger and the donkey. This may have been listed as a beginner or easy nativity, but I think you'll have to agree this makes a beautiful Christmas decoration. It's small enough to place on a desk or a shelf, anywhere you'd like a reminder of the reason for the season, the birth of Jesus Christ. As always, I welcome your comments and I respond to every one. Please subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so, and hit the like button to let the YouTube algorithm know it should recommend this video to others. If you're still looking for more Christmas decor ideas, check out the suggestions on the screen for more videos to watch next.